Good morning. My name is Trevor Zielinski. Um, my wife Mallory and I have been coming to Table Church for about four years. One of the things I love so much about this church is how resilient we are. Uh, you know, I come in this morning, we've got a freezing cold entryway, we've got construction, no screen, but we're doing it. We love to be here together, we love to worship together, and no matter what, we're going to do it. So uh, let's read some scripture. Uh, I'm going to read from 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Amen. And thanks, Trevor, for that reminder that um, just because the screen doesn't work and the air conditioner is possessed doesn't mean that we can't worship, right? And I can easily forget that and get kind of down. And I call these Sundays Bermuda Triangle Sundays. It's like stuff's just weird, you know. It's just not, th things aren't working quite right. And the enemy's saying stuff to me about your sermon is lame, you know. And it's just like, no, like God is here today and that's what matters most. Everything else is just a footnote, amen? Amen. All right. So, yeah, come on. I might as well go for it if we're going to start. <laughs> we're going to might as well follow through. Hey, my, I want to remind you guys of a few things. First of all, Megan mentioned the baptism birthday bash coming up. Be sure to mark down your calendar for October 6th. And my last couple weekly emails I've sent, I've had the wrong date. I've said October 5th, I think two weeks in a row now. Listen, my wife and my son's birthday is on October 5th. The church I planted is born on October 6th. My parents' anniversary is Octo also October 5th. I just got a lot going on, so just give me a little grace for that. But it's October 6th at 2 o'clock. Hope to see you there. If you want to be baptized, please uh, let us know as well. And we're continuing our, um, our drive for the Edmonds uh, Hygiene Drive. If you've got stuff to bring, thanks to those of you that brought stuff today. Uh, there's a tub out in the lobby. You can drop it in there. we got one more Sunday, I think, in September. So if you haven't brought anything yet, be sure to bring it uh, next week. So in 2016... Some people online noticed a very strange trend. There was a surprising number of news stories that were coming online that were originating from the same small Eastern European village. And the thing that many of these news stories had in common is that they, they had completely ridiculous headlines. For example, Pope Francis endorses Donald Trump as president and that kind of stuff. And, and so this, along with other kind of attempts to um, affect the minds of Americans gave rise to a phenomenon that has been called now fake news. And soon in that presidential campaign, fake news was being slung everywhere. People were accusing everything they didn't like of being fake news. And it exposed a real problem that we have in our culture, and that is how do we know who to trust? How do we know where to find the truth? Just because something's online doesn't mean it's true. And it doesn't matter how reputable it looks, how do I actually know that it's true. You see, what we've kind of realized recently is this. Today we have a truth problem. We have a truth problem today. What I mean is that we don't necessarily always know where to find the truth. Because when you have a breakdown in a culture and no longer do you know what sources of truth to trust, well, you've got a truth problem. Now this series that we're in right now is ultimately about truth. It's called Trendy how to tell the difference between what's trendy and what's true. And we're looking at some popular cultural ideas, and we're doing it not because we want to criticize them or critique them. We're looking at them because we want to say, how do we see this through the lens of Scripture? And more importantly, what does it tell us about our culture? What's the ache beneath this trend? What's the cry beneath this trend? Today's trend we're going to talk about is this very common idea of speaking my truth. Maybe you've said it, maybe you've heard someone say it, Sp I'm going to speak my truth. I'm going to talk about kind of what it means to be in a culture where the phrase, speak my truth, can make logical sense. First of all, I'm not sure exactly where it started, it's probably been around a while, but 
But I can tell you where I think it became popular, and that was through Oprah. Oprah gave an acceptance speech at the 2018 Golden Globe Awards, and she said this line. She said, speaking your truth is the most powerful tool you have. Speaking your truth is the most powerful tool you have. Now, the way that Oprah was using the phrase here is very important. Because what she was talking about, well, she was sp specifically about women who have been abused or harassed. And it kind of gave rise to what became known as the Me Too movement on social media, where women were finally, many for the first time, having the courage to come out and say, yes, I too have experienced abuse. And it was kind of this cultural watershed moment, like a tidal wave. And it's like many were overwhelmed with just how many women have gone through such things. And so really, the, the, the origin, perhaps, of the phrase, I don't know if it's the origin, but at least where it became popular, was around something that we can absolutely celebrate. In fact, I would say it's biblical. Shining a light in darkness is what was happening. That's what it meant to speak my truth. It really just meant share your story. You know, we've got you. We, you're seen. We hear you. And so for a while there, speaking my truth was really quite a, a great and, and beautiful opportunity for many people. But of course, as often happens in culture, the, original, the origination of something or something in its purest form doesn't always stay that way. And it's a much more ambiguous thing anymore. And really, it's used in all sorts of ways today. In fact, one author and speaker um, that I found online who talks about this stuff a lot, here's how he, dis how, how he described truth. And he is not being sarcastic when I read this quote. He, he's, this is really what he thinks. He says, Truth is not about being right. Truth is about how we feel and what is real for us. Truth is not about being right, he says. Truth is about how we feel and what is real for us. Look, what this is, is this is, we've talked about the age of authenticity. This is it in a nutshell. This is our modern era's kind of inward ethical turn in a nutshell, what's good is what's inside of you, and what you should do is affirm it and express it. Now, after Oprah's speech, no big surprise, there were those who kind of criticized this popular phrase of speaking my truth. And there was an article in The Atlantic, for example, that said, asked the, que the obvious question, how can, how can truth be mine? How can truth be mine or yours? How do we own the truth? What if my truth conflicts with your truth? What if my truth is racist and misogynist? Like, what do we do then, you know? And, and, and people would say, I think a lot of Christians would probably say this too. They would say, you know what? Truth is true no matter how you feel about it. Truth is outside of you. Two plus two equals four is true. Doesn't matter how you feel about it, okay? You can't make your own truth. And so the people in that camp are trying to make a point about truth. They're trying to say, look, truth is objective. Truth is outside of you. Truth doesn't care about your feelings. So you have this kind of objective understanding of truth. And then you also have the more subjective, we'd call it, understanding of truth, where, you know, we say, look, truth is something that I kind of construct for myself, that truth is really only true to me depending on how it impacts me. And things like that. So you have the objective understanding of truth and the subjective understanding of truth. And I actually think both pop up in our culture all over the place. And really, the emphasis on objective truth kind of goes with early, the early modern era. The emphasis on subjective truth kind of goes with the late or postmodern era. And both of them, we live in a time where they are overlapping. And so we have these two kind of understandings of truth that are popular in our culture today. And the way that I would summarize kind of the shortcomings of both, I actually think there's something good about each, something true about each, but I'm going to describe the shortcomings through a, like caricaturing them. So the objective view of truth can become the mad scientist, all right? So the mad scientist, what does he do? He, he believes that truth is there for me to harness. Truth is there for me to control and use for my purposes, Truth is something that I stand above. I dissect on my operating table in my lab. This is the early modern human conception of, of truth. We kind of slid into this. Coming out of the scientific industrial revolution, 
uh, we had a very high view of the human intellect, of our powers of reason to kind of harness nature, harness truth, and lead us into a utopia. And so early modern era was very optimistic about the power of us to use the truth for our benefit. And what happened was we did have a lot of really good scientists in there with the mad scientists, and we got stuff like vaccines and heart transplants and all really amazing stuff. But what also happened is in the 20th century, we created the, you know, the atom bomb and weapons of mass destruction, and it became the bloodiest century ever in the existence of humanity. And, and pretty soon we, some people started to realize, you know what, this whole modern thing has like a little bit of a mad scientist, a little bit of a Lex Luthor vibe, you know, like... Maybe, maybe not everything here is as cut and dried as we thought, and pretty soon another understanding of truth started to emerge. As this fails us, the mad scientist gave way to the hippie. And the hippie is different from the mad scientist. The hippie says, you know, man, the truth isn't out there. It's in here. Like, the truth is all about how you feel. It's an earlier quote. Truth is not about being right. That's heresy over here. Truth is about how it makes you feel and what's real for you. And so if I'm going to caricature the two, I don't know, errors that we can slide into with these two, um, the objective and the subjective understanding of truth, I would say, on one hand, we can become a mad scientist. The other hand, we can turn into the hippie. Uh, but here's the thing. They, mo they might both appear to be opposites, but they hold a very, very important thing in common, and that's this. In modernity... Truth is seen as something we control. In the modern era, truth can be seen as something we control. It's something we discover in order to harness, in order to use, or it's something that we construct. Whether it's early modern or postmodern, like truth is often seen as something that we control. Now I want to look at truth now through a biblical lens today. Starting with our passage in verse 5, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Now, darkness and light, two very common themes in the Bible, often used to demonstrate, you know, goodness and evil, also used to demonstrate, like, the, the con or contrast uh, truth and falsehood, truth and lies, truth and untruth. John's just saying here, look, there's no falsehood in God. There's no untruth in God. God is 100% the truth. He goes on in verse 6, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. I am going to zero in on that verse today, particularly the last few words. I like the translation where it says, We lie and do not live out the truth. Did you know that truth is something that you must live out? In fact, the word there, the phrase live out, comes from one Greek word. It's the word poieo. It's a verb that's very common in the Bible. It simply means to do or to make. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in the beginning, God poieoed the heavens and the earth. It's just something you make or to do something. You can say, hey, man, what are you going to poieo today? What are you doing today? It's a very common, very, it's all over the place. Anytime somebody does something, they're poieoing, they're poieoing it. And so... Today, we, we hear that, and it sounds strange to us. How is truth something that you, that you live out, something you do? Because for us, truth is something that happens in here. And yet the Bible is saying, no, you live it out, you do, you poieo the truth. In fact, in first semester Greek in seminary, a lot of times you'll translate 1 John because it's like kindergarten Greek. It's really basic Greek. And so when you get to that verse, I remember translating it for the first time, being like, that's so cool. Because you literally translate it like, we lie and we do not do the truth. We're not doing the truth, we say. Truth is something that you do, according to John. But again, that, that's weird to our ears. Truth is something you think to us. Truth is something you do in your brain, not in your body. How can truth be something you do? And the Bible writers would say, well, you know what? Y'all have shrunk truth. I mean, yeah, like having thoughts that correlate to reality, that's, that's part of it. But there's so much more to truth than that. In fact, the writers of Scripture, I think, would agree with this sentence. They would say, truth is about a pattern of life that matches deepest reality. It's about a pattern of life 
that matches deepest reality. In other words, it is something you do. It's something you poirier own. See, look, the, the hippie forgets that truth is outside of me. Like, there's stuff that's true that it doesn't matter how I feel about it, really. You know, like, that, it's still true. The mad scientist, though, he forgets that you can't just know the truth because data by itself is nothing. You have to do something with the data, and that is an ethical judgment. And, and so you may know everything there is to know in the universe. You might have the biggest brain of all and know all the facts about the universe. But that does not bring you a single inch closer to living a truthful life. Because the truth is something that you must live out. And so the mad scientist and the hippie both forget something that I think the Bible teaches us, and that it's this. Truth has a claim on me. Truth has a claim on me. Truth is not something I harness. It harnesses me. Truth is not something that I own or something I control. It's not something that I simply know or simply I, something I simply believe. Truth is something I surrender to. Truth has a claim on me. I must pattern my life according to truth. We've tried to emphasize this a lot at Table Church. We say Christianity is not just a belief system. It's not just something you think in your head. Christianity is a summons to a truthful life. It is a call to say, hey, come and live in such a way that matches deepest reality. As Jesus stands before Pilate, Pilate actually says the question, what, what is truth? And at some point, Jesus, in that conversation, he's going he's gonna to tell Pilate, you know what? My kingdom is not of this world. In other words, my kingdom is different than this place. It runs on different rules. And the people who live in my kingdom are going to look a little different. Oh, and by the way, and my kingdom is much more true and real than yours. You see, a life of truth is one that patterns itself based off of that truer, deeper kingdom reality. Jesus calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. Think about how active those words are. When he says way, it's just the Greek word for road. He said, I'm the road. I'm the path. What do you do on a road? You walk on a road. It's not something you think. It's something you do. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's saying, look, when you are in me, it's going to be something that's going to require all of you. Your entire self, your entire being. See, being a Christian is not just something you do in your brain. It's something you do with your life. And what that means is this. This is important. Truth is not something you simply think you wear your way into. Tru truth must be lived in order to be known. Truth must be lived in order to be known. That's important for us kind of modern, cerebral people to understand. Truth must be lived in order to be known. And here's what I mean by it. One of the basic doctrines of Christianity is that if, if you confess your sins, it even says it in our passage today. Let's read it because this is good stuff. Um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we can confess our sins to God and he promises to purify us. All right, that's like a basic truth of Christianity, right? But knowing that is not the same as knowing it. Knowing that is not the same as actually experiencing the forgiveness and the cleansing that comes from confessing your sins. You can't know the truth until you live the truth. You can't think your way into the truth. Simply knowing it to be true is not nearly the same. In fact, it's no, you're nowhere closer to being truthful until you've actually lived it. There's, there is a qualitative abyss between simply knowing that Christianity teaches forgiveness of sins and experiencing having your sins forgiven by God. They are not the same thing. And over here, you have not entered truth yet until you actually live the life of having been forgiven by God. And you can go on down the list of all the things that are the most important truths of the world, of our faith, and it's the same for all of them. Truth is not something you simply think your way into. It's something that must be done. It's something you poie o. 
Now, this is a problem for our discipleship today. We often think that growth, spiritual growth, means like learning more stuff. And again, the Bible, would, the Bible writers would say, well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's part of it. You've got to learn stuff. But it means nothing until you actually do something with it. And so throughout this series, we've asked ourselves, we've, we've said Jesus wants to give us x-ray vision. We've got this trend, speak my truth. What's going on underneath that? Wh why do people today say, you know what, truth is not about being right, it's about how you feel. Well, we've identified part of it. Part of it is that, no, actually what it means is <laughs> some people have gone through some really horrible things and then others have not believed them. And so then we're going to speak our truth. But really what they're doing is they're speaking the truth. But why is it that it's become such a widespread thing that truth is this thing that I kind of construct within me? That what's most true is how I feel? Where does this come from and what does it mean? I suspect that there's a lot to it, but if, if, if I had to guess, I think that my suspicion is that this ache that's beneath it is just the need to feel safe in a world that is absolutely undependable. We need to feel safe. We have a world full of fake news and constant division and we don't know who to trust and that's a scary place to be. We live in a place where I don't know if what I'm being told is true and I don't know if I tell the truth if others will believe me. You see, the modern world that we live in has, uh, has offered us many promises through technology and education and politics and materialism. We've been told, like, we will be led, we will, we will arrive in utopia. And yet today, for the first time in our nation's history, young people believe that they are going to be worse off than their parents. We live in a world we've talked about before where deaths of despair are skyrocketing. These are deaths by suicide, addiction, alcohol. You see, the brighter future, the aid that the age of reason promised us hasn't really materialized. No wonder people feel like they need to make their own truth because they don't know who to trust anymore, so they create their own. And all it says, all it leads me to know is that this, our world is hungry for truth. <laughs> our world is looking for a way of life that actually works, that actually leads to peace. The problem is you can't know it until you do it. You can't know the peace until you live it out. People are exhausted and they're reaching for something secure, but they're confused and they don't know where to look. And so we've committed as a church to pray for people in our lives that are searching for God. We call them people of peace. And they're down here in this box. If you want to put a person of peace, a name in there that you're going to pray for, we pray for them every week as a staff. But here's what we can take from this today. And as we engage with our people of peace, as the, the people in our life that don't know Jesus, we can ask ourselves the question, how can I do the truth in front of them? How can I do the truth in front of the people in my life? Remember, it's not just about telling them stuff that is true. It's about living in a way that is true because Jesus is the road. How can I walk the road? And then when they see it, they'll say, you know what? That road's going somewhere I want to go too. I remember a few years ago, before we moved to Des Moines, I was going to go work with Poetis in Zambia, and there was a guy that I knew who wasn't a Christian. In fact, he's kind of ag antagonistic towards Christians. And I was telling him about the ways that our church was kind of finding creative ways to solve problems and relieve disparities in Zambia and serve the people there. And, and just some of the beautiful stories that had come out of that experience. And, and he was so inspired. It was just something inside of him was like, I want to be a part of that. And he was trying to find a way for him to go to Zambia. He's not even a Christian. But he just knew, I just want to be a part of that. There's something about that way that I want to, that I want to walk as well. He never actually made it there, but there was something inside of him that said, that's true. I want to pattern my life out of that. that. There's something going on here that's truer than all the kind of materialistic endeavors that I've pursued. And I want to be a part of that. This is my prayer. This is why I'm, I'm passionate about immigrant, immigrant connection because... Yeah, I mean, we're providing legal services for people at a low cost, but my prayer is that someday some of these children of these families, and, and we serve a lot of families who are immigrants or refugees, and they're going to say, you know what? We came here. We didn't, know, we didn't know heads or tails about this legal system. We had a pile of things we had to do, a ton of money it cost us. 
And when my family needed it most, it was the Christians that stepped in. Maybe there's something to that. And it's because we're, we're not just simply saying the truth or thinking the truth, we're doing the truth. It's something you poyeo. One scholar of the early church was asking the question, how, how did the early Christians just spread so quickly? And it's one of the, I don't know, kind of one of the big historical mysteries, if you will. And there's been a few books written on it, but it's just a remarkable fact how fast early Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire. In, in a world that was antagonistic towards it, made a mockery of it, crucified their leader, crucified many of their other leaders. How, how did this little kind of backwater corner of the empire group of peasants start something that eventually took over the whole empire? And so it's kind of a remarkable story when you think about it, but Ellen Kreider puts it like this. He says the Christian's focus was not on saving people or recruiting them. It was on living faithfully in the belief that when people's lives are rehabituated in the way of Jesus, others will want to join them. Can we start living radical lives of the way of Jesus out there? Like when we stop chasing the trends of this world and start chasing deeper reality and pattern our life out of the kingdom of God, which says, love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemy. It says, you know what, money, take it or leave it. It's not all it's cracked up to be. If you have it, give it. It says all sorts of things that just cut against the grain of our culture. And it turns out that when people started actually living that out, to actually taking the way of Jesus seriously, like people started noticing. And it was a remarkable change. And so this should be our focus when, we, when it comes to our people of peace. It's, it's not simply, hey, how can I say the right words to them? It's how can I live a life of truth in front of them and invite them into it? It's about doing the truth and inviting them to join you. Because when you really buy in, what you'll find is that actually this is the way to peace. It really does answer your deepest questions. But you can't know it until you do it. Truth is something we do. And so as we continue to challenge ourselves with the folks in our lives that don't know God, we're gonna, um, we've put something on the calendar that I want to invite you to. On October 12th, that's a Saturday, we're going to have a prayer burn in our, in our mini, um, ministry center, in the prayer room in our ministry center. And it's specifically going to be geared for our pop box. And so it's going to be from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., half-hour time slots, 12 hours of unbroken prayer is what we're going for. And you can sign up for a time slot. You can take 30 minutes or you can take an hour. You can take as much as you want. If we get too much, we can just extend it 13, 14, 15 hours. That's totally fine. And we're going to have the pop box in the, in the room. And we're just going to encourage you to go through each one as you pray and just pray for the Lord to meet each one of these names. We're going to take all the names here. And, and if, if you wrote the full name of somebody on your card, we're just going to put their first name, all right, just for discretion. Uh, and so there will be cards, there will be full of cards that have names on them of people that were, that were saying, God, help me do the truth in front of this person. Help me live out the truth in front of them so that they might want to know you as well. So just write the word prayer on your connection card. If you'd like to sign up for a time slot for the uh, prayer burn on October 12th, and we'll send you the information that you need. But we're really excited just to continue to, continue to see how God's going to kind of shape us as we become more missional as we become uh, more courageous followers of Jesus and of the gospel. All right, would you pray with me? Well, Lord Jesus, we declare today that we're done just thinking truth. We want to do truth. We want to live out truth. We want to walk the road, the way, the truth, and the life that you are. We want to follow you. We don't want to just believe in you. We want to live with you. And so show us more and more ways to do the truth be one of those people that John talks about who lie because they don't do the truth because they think that there's nothing wrong with it there's no sin in it no Lord we want to be like the people talked about after that who confess their sins and who experience the fact that you are faithful and just and that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness and we want to be people that demonstrate that and invite others into it and so Lord I pray over um, the relationships 
that we have and for the people that I think when we talk about speaking our truth so often, Lord, it, I think it's a, it's a way of, or it demonstrates just how worried we are about finding something actually true. We have a truth problem today. We don't know who to trust. But as we said earlier, you are good. We can also add to that, you are also true. You are the truth. And we acknowledge it and we surrender to it now. Because truth has a claim on us. So be our king and be our God as we lead from here now as your followers. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and join us in this last song?